My name is Sassan Kim Simon, and I will be the host and moderator tonight with this um, wonderful conversation that we are going to have with Rebecca Prince-Ruiz, who's written this um, book called Plastic Free, The Inspiring Story of a Global Environmental Movement and Why It Matters. Um, it's written with Joanna Atherfold Finn. Um, and before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that we are meeting here on Numa Buja, and that it's particularly apt that as we acknowledge um, elders past and those who are yet to emerge, that we are talking about a book that is very much about um, the environment and about our Mother Earth, which so many indigenous cultures recognize and respect as the, the, the only reason we are able to be here. So. Um, it is particularly special, I think, that we that we meet on this on this new online today. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. It is a full house in a newly socially distant world. So um, it's a full house, and yet we are spaced apart, which is um, strange, um, but it's wonderful to see you all here. And we are being joined with people on Zoom. So. We will have a Q&A box that is on the Zoom. And so if people who are not in the room with us physically want to ask questions, please do so by um, just filling in the question. And then Jane will sort of read the question out. Um, people in the room don't have to fill in the Q&A box. <laughs> <laughs> you can just ask. So Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. You are the founder of the Plastic Free July movement. You um, asked a simple question um, about um, what it might be like to go for a whole July party, and it sort of started this global movement. So a couple of things about this book. Um, in many ways, I found it, I was scared to read it because um, often when I think about the challenges that face us with climate, with plastic, with the sort of mess that we have made um, with this planet, it feels overwhelming. And it was one of the least overwhelming and most practical and inspiring stories that I have read. So it definitely felt like a game changer for me. Um, so I want to say firstly, thank you for that. Um, numbers can often be incredibly intimidating. Uh, I've been part of many social movements. And when you read figures, it kind of can feel like there's this unstoppable force of happening. And there is this way in which you two have written this book that gives us numbers um, to give hope. You don't feel as though the numbers are going to overwhelm you. You feel like the numbers are driving you to change and the ways to do that are very practical. So again, wow. So let's start. Your book begins with the story about you going to the recycling plant and having this horrible sinking feeling. And I'd love you to describe to people what that day was um, in July 2011. Was it in July or was it just in 2011? Uh, it was the end of June 2020. And so for me, it was an open experience. I had, I knew what a landfill site was. I used to have to go to the tip with my dad who had to drive me home and take care of the umbrella off. But going to a recycling facility was a, was a game changer for me. and. You know, I knew what my waste looked like when I put it in my bin at the end of each fortnight. And if, and if that yellow lid of recycling bin was full, I felt really good. Like I was helping the planet. Like it was my mission to fill that recycling bin. And when I went to this facility, and for the first, you know, we, we talk about throwing things away, but we don't really know where that is. And so when I went to that facility and I saw for myself the first time what, what my waste looked like, from our family with my neighbours and everyone on my street and my suburb and it was this mountain of waste and all of a sudden there was this complex energy intensive really frenetic moment of dealing it with machines and conveyor belts and then and people mm. like there were people in there handling it and they were touching it and it was a really hot day and they were mm. kind of at the top of this facility and it just I don't know what I was expecting, but it certainly wasn't that. And that, so for me that night when I went to put out my, my recycling and I just looked at this item, I think it was a yogurt container, and I thought I could see where it was going to go and something really shifted for me and I thought, I know where this is going to go 
I know how, how much of a journey it's got to go, what, what could I do differently? What can I do to, to change that and make a difference? And so it was this, and look, I'd heard of people doing challenges before. I'd heard of people trying to avoid plastic and do a whole bunch of things. But for me, it was this really personal, I've seen it and I can't unsee it and I'm going to mm. do something. Mm. That thing about not being able to unsee it is sort of like a theme that comes up again and again in the book. And some of it is about this idea that um, that we can be wrongheaded in our good intention, but um, you have this way of not making that a judgment. So one of the most um, stark images I have from reading the book is you tell this you tell the story of the relationship between um, rivers and ri plastic that starts in rivers and how it ends up in the sea, which I had never made that connection, right? And you talk about um, how litter is often a, it's simply a consequence of plastic. It's not a consequence of someone trying to do the wrong thing by littering on purpose. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that example was really useful and it, it might be something worth sharing with people. Yeah. The guy in St. George's Terrace. Yeah, yeah. Or actually, it's a person in St. George's Terrace. Thank you Terrace. so much for correcting me because I <laughs> noted it when you when you wrote it. You wrote it as a they, and I was yeah. like, great. And then yeah. I defaulted into the guy. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, well, it did start. You probably saw it was originally a guy, and then it became a person. Because <laughs> 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 it's an office so. book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, it's really interesting to some because you know well, I've done a lot of talks about the conservation of Problems. I've been to so many documentaries, uh, way too many documentaries, to see these images, and everyone thinks it's not me. I don't litter. I've never been somewhere to a talk and someone said, oh, yeah, that, I'm the person. That, that's my plastic <laughs> company. It's like everyone thinks uh, it, it, it's those bad and naughty people out there. And I'm, look, there are people who intentionally litter. There's no doubt about that. But you're absolutely right. It's just it's the material because all of the things that are so valuable about plastic, the fact that it's cheap, the fact that it's lightweight, it's durable, we can mould it into anything we want and it lasts forever, mm. are all of the things that make it a problem when it end up in the environment. And I think for me it was really important to give people that sense of so there's this kind of water thing flowing through the book, but to give Good use people, of metaphor. There's a water <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, to, you can tell. <laughs> um, to just give people the sense of, you know, what, what we're finding in the ocean, we're not going to fix it by cleaning up beaches. We've got to start where we're using it. We've got to start back up here in the catchment so that story of that fictitious person on Sir George's Terrace who grabbed that sink, it was about grabbing a single-use mint. Um, won't name the brand from that bowl as they were leaving a meeting, carefully putting it in the bin and the gust of wind blowing it onto the street and the next uh, deluge of rain, washing it into the gutter, into the swamp everything, and then emerging on my local beach. Mm. And like for me, I, I read those, you read numbers and I read statistics and I can read papers, but I've got to understand yeah. stuff in pictures. So. Yeah, yeah. And that's a particularly powerful example because nobody was trying to do anything wrong. This office worker had, you know, diligently put the plastic wrapper into the bin, and the nature of the the nature of the plastic makes our good intentions actually. And so then you're so then you move from there into like the only logical thing to do is to think about reducing, right? So that it's not to it's not to use it in the first place. And so this is where plastic green July comes in. So one of the things that I found fascinating was the fact that you talk about this shift that has happened in the last decade in terms of attitudes towards plastic. And you describe an initial conversation that you had had when you first launched with the radio host to just, you know, talk about single use plastic. And again, it'd be great to hear you talk about how people initially received the idea and how far we've come. Yeah, we've We've come a long way. So that radio interview, I remember feeling really frustrated at the time. I think it was one of the first radio interviews I'd ever given, so I was probably quite nervous and just couldn't get across the concept that it was. I mean, and, and the problem is in the title, like plastic crew, that's just not achievable. None of us got here 
tonight, no matter what form of transport you took, you took there was no plastic involved. And so um, it, in this interview, it was done by phone. I can picture it really clearly. I was in my daughter's bedroom, he was pacing up and down as I was talking and he kept saying, but Rebecca, your phone's plastic, your car's plastic, your computer's plastic. But I know, you know, plastic has, has a value as a usable material, but it's it's the way that we're using it, not the material, how we use it. And um, we describe in the book, fast forward the clock to 2018, and according to Collins Dictionary, plastic free, was the word of the year. So to me that I'm sure we all know what the word of the year is going to be this year and it's not going to be single use this year, it's yeah. going to be something else. Um, yeah, that just showed me how far we've come and to me I, I, when I, th I think about things like that and it gives me hope that, you know, of course we've got a long way to go but just that change that we've been able to, that we've been a part of over the last ten, nine or ten years has really been significant. Um, one of the things that's interesting, I was going to read a quote, but I don't want to at the moment. One of the things that was really interesting to me is that it's, of course, on one level, it's about plastic and it's about this massive problem that we have, but a lot of it is about a throwaway mentality that things uh, you know plastic is most plastic that we use is used for 12 seconds 12 minutes but it's useful for 12 minutes and then it kind of lives forever and that idea of what that 12 minutes is like what what are you gaining in that 12 minutes I, I found your idea of a plastic free philosophy really compelling and I'd love you to talk a little bit about what what is the plastic free philosophy yes. So I think that that the plastic that plastic has become synonymous not just with that with the throwaway society which equates to the, the convenience lifestyle and it was really only by trying to avoid it and I'm not I'm not plastic free because I'm perfect but we made some big changes in our family and it was only really by trying to avoid it ourselves and being in this group and this community of people that were all, you know, including some of um, people who are here in this room that were our early adopters, um, that we actually started to realise what trying to avoid it meant. Mm. And, you know, one of the first things was just not being able to go to this, not being able to do a weekly shop at the supermarket for a family because you know, you can only survive so long on avocados and bananas before <laughs> kids started to complain and so as you know it changed so many things that I think we've just taken for granted before or not even seen like I didn't I didn't realize how much plastic there was in my life I didn't have so much plastic in my shop. and by trying to avoid it it meant that I needed to just be more thoughtful be a bit more present in the mm. choices that mm. I was making mm planning what I was going to eat rather than just grabbing something from convenience learning to find out where to buy alternatives going to farmers markets and and having a different diet as well not just having I thought we were pretty good but just realizing how much of what we were you know try, we always tried to not buy too much packaged or preserved mm. or processed food mm. but thinking, well, where did my food come mm. from? Um, and realising a lot of the stuff in plastic was, had a lot of food miles, wasn't mm. in season. Mm. You know, do we really need to eat grapes yeah. and yeah. From mangoes? California. From California all, and all year round. In the winter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah. So it shifted a lot of things in quite surprising ways. One of the things that I especially appreciated was how it shifted. So on the one hand, making changes like that, does feel overwhelming because there's a lot of things, lots of calculations that you're making uh, that someone who isn't making them now is like, oh my God, that's a long road to walk. And yet why, what was, what's powerful about the book is that you show us how you got there. So this isn't like 
you don't start on day one thinking about food mouth. It's you show us the journey. But what was interesting to me was um, often I'm overwhelmed by the idea of start having to plan so far in advance. But you talked about the things that are more able to happen that are spontaneous as a result that are about your family life and the kind of, you know, the idea of, I think it was you and Lewin sort of making garlic bread off the cuff and having, if you had bought the garlic bread in a prepackaged, you wouldn't have had that, those moments. And for me, the thoughtfulness is both about the food, but about a kind of care. Um, and that to me felt like that's the philosophical kind of part of the book. Yeah, it's, it's the care and it's the time. Like convenience, you know, what, what, what does convenience give us? Is it, is it giving us the opportunity to just do lots of things at once and be busy and rush around? Whereas it's that taking a step back and spending that time and being thoughtful, mm. um, I think is, is where the, a lot of the value is. And it's interesting at the end of each July, a lot of the kind of surprising feedback that, that we get from people is that they feel healthier, happier, and more connected with their community. And actually now, interestingly, given our data, our mm. research that shows an increase in, in well-being. I mean, it's not to say that it's easy. It yeah. is a challenge and, you know, we, we may pass through. Friday last weekend and it you know takes ages to sweep it up and clean the floor <laughs> afterwards and there was a flower everywhere and then the dog tried to eat it it was hanging up drying and it was kind of chaos but it was fun and, and we all did it yeah and it, there's those really nice things yeah that come with it and not that you take on all of them all the time but it is there's a slowing down there's that yeah. that having that coffee in a cafe and not just standing there with flipping it yeah. at home while you're, yeah. Yeah. while you're waiting for that takeaway cup. You can do that. Guilty. Well, you already do that. Yeah, no, I'm guilty. Yeah. 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 But it's yeah. kind of nice. It's nice yeah. to sit down and drink it and smell the coffee, not not just smell the plastic view as you're walking <laughs> and on your phone. And, That's right, yeah. doing too many things and bumping into, into people because you're not paying attention. Oh. Um, Talk to us about the difference between the bag of shame and the bag of dilemma. Talk, that concept to me was so interesting and powerful, not just for plastic, but for life. Um, yeah, I really love it. Yeah, so um, the dilemma bag was something we did in our first year of Plastic Free Supply. So it was just to keep all the plastics we couldn't avoid, um, that we'd accidentally received, kind of just said no straw in your drink. And to um <laughs> it was all those things and when i i had i heard about a group a couple of years earlier of people doing um a plastic challenge and they called it the war on plastic and they kept this shame bag and i couldn't buy into it and and you know it was where i was at i hadn't had that experience myself but i don't even know if we consciously thought about it the name just didn't resonate so we called it a dilemma bag mm -hmm. and it was useful because what was in our dilemma bag we had it at work and we could have those conversations mm -hmm. and pull out the items and together figure out solutions so mm -hmm. it had that kind of use but but the language is really important and I know you know following on from that I can't remember if we wrote about this in the book or not but the the when we started using social media and we started to you know, follow this plastics issue. A lot of the um, a lot of the people that were kind of starting on the journey at the same time as us and we were going, it was right. Here's this piece of litter. I'm going to take a photograph of it. I'm going to shame. Or here's a cafe that's putting straws in their drink for a a, a brand of um, litter that and name a company. But that didn't feel right to me and it felt right to say, oh, here's a cafe that's doing the right thing. They've put their straws away or they've switched to paper straws. So they'll give you a discount if you bring your own cup or here's a butcher that will be happy for you to bring your own container. Like That just felt 
uh, well, I think maybe I was too shy and nervous to, <laughs> um, scared um, to, to, to do that blaming and shaming yeah. thing. And we did that intuitively mm. at the beginning, but now I've learned that, that that's what worked. Yeah, yeah. I think so much of that uh, example is helpful in thinking about social movements more broadly. The notion of um, what, how far you get with in, with inclusion, with just the saying, you know, come join, and 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 making the barrier really low. So the idea that having trialed it yourselves, what's interesting is you're always learning, right? So you you're trialing plastic free, and then you're realizing that these things are really hard. So you're sharing that they're hard rather than acting like they're not hard. Um, so there isn't an, a kind of ego investment in what's not working. It's more like, oh, this isn't working. How do we solve it so that other people can see that they're not alone in that journey? And that, that to me, that idea of bringing people along in a moment when we're going through so much global change on so many different things, mm -hmm. feels like a really powerful model of a very wide movement. And I think, again, I think that's something that just happened and evolved. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's interesting. I've been working with a behavioural economist over the last couple of years. He does. <laughs> he gets a lot in the back of the book. That's another goal. You can never have enough to stuff. But um, so I think what, you know, one of the really big things that I've learned through doing this work is that just because somebody doesn't do the same thing as me, it doesn't mean that they don't care. Yeah. It, um, you know, we started to do these surveys and we found out that eight out of 10 people in Western Australia are concerned about their plastic ending up in the land and in the ocean. And I said to Colin, well, can that be, can that be true? And because it can't be true. And he said that, that we explained it in terms of this disconnect with our thinking and our attitudes and our values and our choices and our behaviours. And I think what we were able, because we didn't set out to start an education campaign, we were really about changing ourselves and our part. We didn't have all the answers, but mm. in our group, we had lots of ideas. And then it really organically and, and virally and through social media and word of mouth mm. conversations, other people joined in and they made changes. And so then we say, oh, here's a group in Margaret River and they're mm. doing this, so we're going to share that. Or, mm. This is what my farmer's market is doing. So it was just, it was so collaborative and, mm. and it's like that to this day. And I think for me that's just one of the biggest lessons that I have learned through this movement is that, you know, I do think we have more in common than we do mm. that which divides us. Okay. And I learned so much from I feel like um, your social media journey is also really fascinating and interesting. I was reflecting a lot as I read the book that we are definitely, the last 10 years has been, I didn't look up the statistics if I were, I wish I had had the time, um, but the last 10 years has been a time in which, you know, Facebook, and Twitter and all this stuff has like massively ex exploded, that growth. And with that growth in social media has also come a cynicism and divisiveness, a polarization of those me of those mediums, of those forms of engaging, and yet um, so much of the story of plastic free is profoundly interlinked with being able to reach people through those mediums, and it's like this very non-cynical, very powerful use of that medium. That contrast struck me a lot. Um, there is like this way that you guys are doing very hard work very gentle way. And I'd love to hear your reflections on that, on social media and how you've kind of avoided the pitfalls of the social the keyboard warriors and that's, you know, it's such a, a kin space that you've got to use it in a really gentle kind of way. So just walk me through the social media story of the plastic free. Yeah, so it's been an interesting journey. Well, I learned to use social media through it. Um, I was a bit reluctant to start because I had heard those negative my daughter, eldest daughter, um, becoming a teenager and I 
more terrible. All the bad, bad things. things. <laughs> I started using it myself. Um, but it it has been such a positive. I mean, it's been the, the backbone of how it, yeah. how it has grown the social work. The community introduced of it and the, the sharing of ideas and the sharing of the And we've been really fortunate in that we have. I mean, look, if, if I share a photo of me, Black there, but it has been generally like a solitude mm. experience, and I think I think because it's been so real, I do mm. describe in there. I um, can paraphrase my daughter so she can take the photo out of focus. Yeah. Slightly, <laughs> slightly not stronger words used in that <laughs> in the book, but it it was just it was spontaneous. It was not Instagram. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. With somebody asking that question of how do you line your shopping bin without a um, without a bag without a bag and just pulling out the I think it was the high tech iPhone three and taking a photo <laughs> of our bin that was a bit grotty with the community newspaper in and then all of a sudden people around the were going oh yeah I could do that too and you know asking tips for compost or um, you know then people started designing amazing origami ones and. And it was really, really interesting to see, uh, and, and I still find it to, to this day, and uh, I remember it was a couple of years ago that the United Nations Environment Program for the World Environment Day, the theme was Beat Plastic Pollution, and all of their images, all of their images were about beaches covered in plastic and turtles entangled in plastic and and it just makes you feel with feel full of despair yeah. and lack of hope. And you're going to get more clicks for that stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you're going to get more clicks. You're going to get more engagement. You're going to get more people donating to your campaign. Mm -hmm. You government funding your campaign mm -hmm. when you share. But does that change anything? Mm -hmm. And when you share photos of people with their reusable bags and people with their funny old lunches that they wrapped up in a handkerchief. You know, whatever, whatever yeah. it is, they're the real stories that people, yeah. people can relate to and they see what they need to do and they see yeah. the solution. And, and I think it was, you know, when we started to take those photos of businesses and mm. the businesses were like, oh, great, because that actually took me time or yeah. it cost me money to right. swap to the paper store. But there's always been this kind of really feel-good yeah, thing about it, and I think that's what attracted others. And I remember um, my uh, I go to a farmer's market in South Mantle, and they'd gone plastic bag free, and I shared that story. And then um, on Facebook, Hollywood, this was you know, back in 2013, Hollywood farmer's market. That's weird. Swoobie's got a farmer's market. Um, Claremont Primary School's got a farmer's market. Why would Hollywood Primary School start a farmer's market? It seems a wee bit close, but yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, good on you, great. And just ask them a couple of questions, how they're going to do it. Had a lovely conversation with them. And then I had another look and was like, oh, this is Hollywood in, in LA. And <laughs> suddenly realised, like, this thing's a little bit, getting a little bit bigger, bigger than, than I thought you had imagined. <laughs> But it's fun and I and I love it. I still love it to this day. It's just what gives me joy when, you know, I'll share something or I'll pose a question and other people will answer before I can. And it's yeah. really yeah. collaborative. Oh, yeah, I have to say I have known Rebecca for a really long time and I've always known what she does and, like, thought it was amazing. But I actually had no idea massive <laughs> it actually is but really embarrassed as I read it I was like how could I have not known how massive this is and and part of that aside from being feeling a little bit ashamed is actually the idea of how um how much a part of what the world has become in the last decade like this has been one step ahead of where the rest of the world was it's sort of pulling um, but people have been moving with it. And so it is easy to not recognize how much of a part of that 
this has this movement has pushed that you know um yeah oh, I had no idea. it's amazing what was the what was the most interesting thing about researching for this book and maybe let me step back at what point you did you decide to write the book because you got the Churchill fellowship and then did you know that as you were sort of you know traveling around the world and talking to different people that this was going to be the thing that you did no <laughs> <laughs> no certainly not I never ever thought I would write a book so I was invited to write the book um by uh from New South and it really was she had um, had a moment of plastic outrage in mm -hmm. her life mm -hmm. and it was when in 2018 when the plastic bag bans came in and yeah. um, one of the supermarkets did that backflip and keep yeah. giving away those yeah. sticker plastic yeah. bags yeah. for free yeah. and she was so angry about that and had seen me on ABC's War on Waste yeah. and called up in the conversation it started from there, so I never imagined myself as a writer, mm. but I'm really glad, although I wouldn't have said this until I actually <laughs> had it in my own I'm really glad that we wrote it and I got to explore those stories and, and talk to so many people mm -hmm. who made this what it is. What was the best bit about writing the book? Doing it with someone else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. You write a book by yourself. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. That's right. Easy when it's memoir because you have <laughs> no one. You don't have to consult anyone. Um, what? Um, and she writes beautifully. It's such a well-written book. It's just easy, but not in that like boring easy. It's incredibly well-written. So please tell Joanna. Um, so what was the best bit about writing it, other than writing it with someone? Like, was there? A particular person you spoke to or a particular moment even in the process where you were like ah oh, I didn't realize that I knew this thing I think for me it was it was finding out how the world it wasn't the right book till I started doing those interviews I think I fully understood it yeah. and I I fully understood why it matters and why it was a story that needed to be told. And so, you know, back in 2011 when we started, there were 40 of us. And then it grew to 400. Like, how amazing is that? And then it grew to 4,000. And I sort of like, you know, when it was 400, pretty much still knew everybody on our mailing list. Yeah. And then, but I knew there were a few people who were doing it or businesses that weren't on the mailing list. Yeah. Just maybe, maybe. Yeah, bit bigger, yeah. and and it grew, you know, so on from there. But I don't know. I didn't really ever know, and we still don't really know how it how it grew. I wish I could have, you know, had that bird's eye view and just watch its its tendrils spread. But I, I've got a lot of ideas. So um, to give you an example, one of the stories we tell in the book and it starts with the very there's 10 chapters for our 10 years and it kind of starts from the very first you know those early years to mm. how people took it from their own lives into their communities and into their workplaces and, and eventually how the US government got engaged and so one of the stories um was an interview that i did with the head of sustainability in new zealand and last year for plastic free july it was splashed across the media they announced the plastic free July they were doubling down on removing the single use plastics from their operations and removing 55 million pieces of plastic in, in one year. And you know, you read things like that all the time and you think, wow, that, that's fantastic. But like how? And why yeah. do they do it for plastic free yeah. July? So when I called and and asked that question, what I loved about that and what helped me understand the importance of individual action is that when you go back through the story it started with somebody who worked for Air New Zealand who took plastic bridge like took the challenge in her own life made changes felt good about what she managed to do then the next year took it into the workplace and it's um it was apparently their most successful mm. workplace challenge ever and at the same time it was the most common letter that people had written in a complaint to Air New Zealand when you were doing plastic free July, 
complaining about their use of single use plastic. And then after that, they looked at it across mm. the business and did this survey. And to me, finding out that story, and that mm. story was repeated, you know, as we talked to a number of businesses, as, we talk, as I talked to um, Michelle Salages, who's the assemblywoman in the state of New York. Mm. And, yeah, that was you know, I was amazed to learn that, that Governor Cuomo had proclaimed July as plastic free July in the state of New York. Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> and you ask those, you know, that's just there, there's the random things I pick up on Twitter. <laughs> um, God knows what else goes on. <laughs> but, you know, you track it back and it just starts with an individual and it just starts with somebody saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to make a change. And it's just, the story of so many ordinary people who are making those changes and are doing something about an issue that concerns them. So mm. for me, it was that really getting that and understanding that that's how change happens. Mm. And it it doesn't happen with talking about it. No. It happens with the doing. Yeah. I mean, that for me, like that, that link between, okay, let's try it. And then that, place where you distill and say okay let's just let's easy entry for this fourth like let's just boil it down to four things that people can can do like four items and then once you realize that actually because then i thought oh that's unambitious come on you know you could do better than that but actually the four items is not the end it's the beginning right and so often when you make something small you think i don't know you know let's do 10 and actually, it was like that four items is the entry point. Once people know they can do the four, then they take on like more and more and more. So that, that it's sort of like this upside down thinking that a lot of social movements focus on really high in the sky things and that this is really about the things that can get done. And then getting the things done means doing more and more and more. I was struck with the Air New Zealand example by how it does feel like, particularly for an airline, like the hardest thing to do, you know, like, and yet the hardest thing to do is the thing that resonates with the most people. I, feel, I mean, that link for me is very profound. It's like, it was very hard. It seemed very hard. It was relatively easy once I had made the decision. And it was also the thing that people appreciated the most and had been wanting anyway, right? I think that stuff is fascinating to me. Yeah, it is. And to me, it just illustrates how far we have come. Yeah. And the, I think that also it, what interests me about that story and some of the other corporate stories is that is everyone's in with this. Mm. You know, there's there's no one that, that you know, both sides of, of, of politics, um, it's it's such an it's an issue that we can all relate to. We're not, not saying well that's not my plastic mm. in the ocean. ocean. There's no not actually plastic. Andrew Bolt. There's no plastic yeah. pollution advocates. Deniers. Yeah, deniers. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we all we can see it. It's very visual, and we all use it in our daily lives. Mm. So and people feel good about making change yeah. and it's that and I think the other key thing is that it's not about a few people doing everything and being so yeah. it's about lots of people doing a few small that's things right. and when you do that at the same time that's when you start to change right. the culture. That's right it's this idea of like the perfect being the enemy of the good or yeah. the other way around however you say it. but like you know that you're trying so hard to be perfect that you don't be good. You end up failing miserable and then you do nothing. Um, so yeah, definitely very, as you can see, this was a very game changing book for me. Like we took pictures of our pantry, didn't we? I think uh, my daughter's here listening in. <laughs> um, so by the end of the book, you have a, a you, you clearly updated it to be in the moment. Uh, and so, COVID and what it's meant for plastic and what do you think with this new normal world we're going to have to live in with things being not what they were before? Is it like 
depressing or is it are there opportunities for us to think differently and new hope yeah um i'm a glass half full kind of thing so i always look for the, look for the positives i mean there's been a lot of conversation in the media about the backward steps about the increase in use of Look, I think there's definitely a role for this material. Um, I think there's opportunities, you know, with the masks, for example, we can, we can look at, at reusable disposal. So we, we finished the book in the first week of March, uh, our editing process, and then, you know, there was a time there when we weren't even sure if the book was going to be printed, and we should go ahead with the last three times exactly what was happening. Mm. So, you know, we saw this increase with the, um, in our medical systems and as restaurants and um, cafes switched to the takeaway model, there was definitely more plastics used there. And I'm getting a lot of questions about that in yeah. the media at the moment. And yeah. There's a lot of conversation. But to me, I'm getting a bit tired of that question because I also think, well, hang on a minute, it wasn't just about that. Like we. We've started spending more time at home. We're yeah. working from home. We're homeschooling our kids, and some people are, yeah. are still in that situation. And for a moment in time, we've stopped shopping as a recreation yeah. pastime. Yes. We've, um, you know, we're perhaps less likely to duck out for a couple of ingredients. Um, lots of people have started baking at home. You know, the nurseries ran out of vegetables seedlings, people, and, you know, that isn't just about trying to live more sustainably about avoiding cravings. It's, it's taking back control in our lives and doing something positive instead of just feeling like everything's out of control and we've got you know, agency about what's going on. So to me, I would like to see this, and, and we've experienced what it's like to not be jumping on a plane all the time about what it looks like in mm. our cities for there to be less cars, see clearer skies, mm. wildlife returning. Mm. So I, you know, and we've had time, you know, many people have had time to think of, of course, that's the future. There's suffering and, and so much, um, you know, more injustices and, and, and inequity than than ever. Um, but I also think it's a time to just rethink about mm. what, we're, what we're doing. And look, one of the, the number that I think has, has shocked me the most in this book is about food waste. Mm. In, this, in this country, we waste 40% of all the food that we grow. And the, the global average is 30%. And a lot of that happens in the home. And so, like, if we're wasting 40% of our food, that's 40% of the money we're paying. Yeah. And, and maybe we can, and that's what we've been kind of really, yeah. guess, encouraging people to do this year is rather than throwing out those vegetables that are being good. And yeah. make a stock, you right. know, avoid that packaging. And right. people have been really on board with that. And so, I think... I think that as as many challenges as there are, there's there's opportunities mm. to to rethink and you know I talk I write a lot about this in the book. We don't want to just be switching single use plastics for single use. Single use something else. Something else, no matter how recyclable or yeah. environmentally friendly it is. Yeah. We've got to do things differently. We are we are using um, the resources the planet can generate. One year, we're yeah. using a lot of time. That's right. So we've got to do stuff. I mean, for me, in many ways, the, this is a good place to round out and open up for questions because there is certainly, um, by the time you, you reach the end of the book, you understand fully that this is not just about plastic and not even is it just that the key to this is a, a way of understanding the world that is about. Um, a set of principles and that this COVID moment is exactly um, 
the response to this COVID moment is uh, a kind of going back to first principles around how to live in a way that isn't throwaway and how to be more thoughtful about everything. Um, and so in many ways, it just like kind of feels like it affirms and confirms the entire ethos of philosophy free, um, rather than is a bump in the road, it feels like a confirmation. Um, so yeah, I, uh, again, cannot thank you enough for such a thoughtful way of looking at the world and approaching um, solving a very practical set of problems. So should we open up to some questions? Including if anyone's on Zoom. Okay, so if people want to ask questions and they're on Zoom, um, you can use the Q and A box, and um, Jane will read out your question. But if anyone in the room who wants to make a comment or a question, please, now is your moment. Can I ask a question? Please don't. Plastic frames are either boring or Can obviously see that. No, people online can raise their hand. Yeah, yeah. People online can raise their hands, so you can also do the work. Yeah. I'm just always interested. Yeah, that. yeah. For some people, I know. So, <laughs> so you know that. So, um, where to from here? What's the future for plastic free? Um, where are you planning and where do you see? So, the question I was repeated is where to from here? What am I planning for my life and what's my future life? I'm planning holiday. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really excited about this board control. <laughs> um, I would love to be going on a road trip with my, with my co author, um, who's now a, a dear friend. I think what, one of the things that I, oh, I have so many plans, so many, so many ideas, and more ideas, I'm renowned for having more ideas that um, have capacity to execute. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, our ongoing goal is always to take this to a mainstream audience and to get the change in the culture, to get to, to leverage the voice and the concerns of the community and business and take responsibility and grab governments and introduce the legislation and the um, regulations that we need, whether that's a plastic cap or a, um, we have a minimum mandate. In packaging products um, for those things. So we have these kind of strategic aims, but also, I guess, one of my big things, which is, as this campaign has grown, it's now so much media and international focus here in Australia, and I'm very aware that we're running it from one of the most remote cities in the world. So I would really like a plastic free July campaign and work as foundation and not for profit that sits behind that of the um the, the um organization and the campaign to reflect our and support our audience and the community like we have a significant amount of media that are in Australia and I know like just as a small example mm. there going back to the social media that um when I had a chance a few years ago to um Visit my sister who lives in India, and I met a local a woman who was championing plastic free China in the South African community. And when Banana started to take some photos and share her photos of people in her community and her friends using their reusables, our participation in the media went up um, 300%. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and the feedback that she got was, um, oh, I used to think. Plastic free July or going plastic free zero waste was for rich white women in New York. Now I know it's for people like me. And so I'm really aware that there's so much more that we could do in terms of supporting the people who are out there already doing it. Um, yeah. One of the big things, and then in the, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just make it like that line notes because government and businesses mm. love to fund recycling, and you, you know that, that too well, Linda. It's you know we'll just put this money into infrastructure or we'll pay for this for, for 
clean up so you can see that mm. you make a difference whereas for us success looks like a different thing we've got nothing to show mm. <laughs> for what we do except some dodgy photos um right. I mean, we do, we've got statistics <laughs> now but yeah how 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 you make good things and grassroots change uh, like any charity like any charity. Mm. pay and be sustainable and support them is uh, mm. probably the story for charities it around is. the world it sure is and the more um, thoughtful and complex your model is, the less likely people are to fund it because it just looks like it gets done. You know, you're so good that no one <laughs> is prepared to fund you because they can't see how much it took to make it happen. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have a, a question from the UK. <laughs> um, are they able to get a book anywhere over there? Do you know if it's actually been published internationally yet? And is it available as an ebook? That might be the easiest way to give away. Yeah, so the question is from somebody in the UK who has asked is that available internationally um, about postage and also ebooks. So the copy at the um, the book at the moment has been published by New South in Australia and New Zealand and I'm um, delighted that in December it will be published the worldwide version will be published by Columbia University Press. So at the moment People in the UK can buy it, um, but you will just need to pay for the postage from Australia. But if you can wait till <laughs> if you can wait till December, um, you can buy it from uh, Colombia, and they also have the audio right. So we're just thinking about that. But we um, yeah, um, also talking to some other publishers about that as well. So hopefully they'll be still having the Southeast Asian edition. Fantastic. Um, and I would urge people to, in the meantime, definitely go check out the website, go check out all the social media because there's lots of really fantastic resources on there as well. Yeah. And I also, um, I would say if you are in Australia, go and ask your local bookstore. Um, yeah. And thanks, Jane. I think times are really tough for our local businesses. And I've just been so overwhelmed and delighted by the response from bookstores. So many of them window displays for plastic free to lie and make really cool signs mm. and they're really engaging their community in the challenge and I'm delighted that so many bookstores are, are selling it and even um, having a conversation with Anise who lives in Kangaroo Valley in New South Wales and she's like I want to really support uh, my local post office in my new business they're mm. really struggling um, and so the publishers have done a deal with post offices oh, of giving them Discounts and people in rural and regional areas can buy the best post office. Yeah, get behind your local bookshops. Yeah, especially independent bookshops. Absolutely. Thank you. So, the story about Air New Zealand um, ethos is fantastic. Have you had any games with other airlines like Qantas? Well, we're having great games with airlines at the moment. Dropped right off on their <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Yeah, we, we have. Um, you know, sometimes airlines will make announcements, or increasingly businesses are making announcements during July of changes to their, around their procurement and reducing the reducing plastic in their, in their operations. So, um, haven't had any um, any kind of formal announcements. July, but have noticed that they have been over the last few years significantly reducing their plastic packaging from when you used to get the trays with the plastic containers and plastic mm. film to you just get the cardboard box. Um, the headphones, they now not in a bag, but they've got a paper band around them and they are actually taking them to be cleaned afterwards. Um, so it's kind of those small things. At one point, you know, they will get involved with the staff and the pilots um, would um, were you know, switching from being switched to a reusable cup. And I um, saw um, at the beginning of the year in the, one of their lounges that they switched from the actual bush lighter to reusable lighter. So I'm um, sorry, uh, just um, oh. And so have seen, you know, 
changes from other businesses. Some are, you know, the best thing is really just reducing overall packaging. It's really difficult with airlines because they switch from plastic bottles to glass bottles, even if they're refillable. The offset in terms mm. of the increased carbon mm. footprint yeah. vastly outweighs any gain. So it's quite, for airlines, it's quite a complex piece. And I remember last year for Plastic Free in July, one of the European airlines introduced a whole bunch of, um, they, they said, oh, we're going plastic free, but they just made a switch to bioplastics. And I was a little bit suspect. One of the challenges with airlines is you might have a really fully um, recyclable piece of packaging, but particularly international airlines. I know this because when I did my Churchill Fellowship, I spent a lot of time in waste facilities and was in one right next to San Francisco International Airport. And they said that basically all of the airline waste they had to incinerate because of quarantine mm. issues. So, you know, sure there was a bunch of recyclable or compostable packaging there. Mm. Um, yeah, but it is great to see so many big businesses now taking on the challenge and using it as a way to change. I think there's this becoming this kind of social license to, to operate and you know, certainly not taking all of the credit for that, but it has become this and uh, focus at this moment of focus mm. for a month around the world where lots of Groups, other charities, and not for profits, councils, schools, all say, I'm going to do something about this issue. Yeah. yeah. We're actually talking about schools. We have another question online from Suzanne. She says she's teaching at a local primary school in Perth and was wondering if you had developed a school program or would you be interested in coming and talking to the students and parents? Especially the parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, Suzanne. So the question was around schools programs. Um, and do we have one? So, so we've got some resources for schools uh, on our website. There's some lovely stories about what schools have done in um, in the book, and it's really an area that we need to work on, on more. And we're actually in the process of starting to develop a schools package. So yeah, have a look on the website. I'm, I think there's so much potential with schools. I'm, and, and why I said particularly parents, because I'm really wary of going into schools and overwhelming kids about the problem. Like kids are smart, they know way more about this issue than I knew when I was their age. But also, I don't like this um, attitude that I often see, which is right, kids, it's, it's your future. Your, your future, you better protect it. That one. <laughs> um, yeah, because like it's not it's not the kids' waste; it's our waste, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, but you know, having having said that, the kids themselves want to do something about it. So a lot of those examples of school things that, that we um, that I know about have been generated by the, the students themselves. So what I what I love to have is those opportunities to take it across the school. So then it becomes about the lunches or um, getting the families to take the challenge and how do we do this mm. together um, rather than just focusing at right kids we're going to educate you and you're going to you're going to fix up our, our, our mess so, um, yeah but it, um, in the first quarter of this year we've been tracking our website and the school pages that we do have are the most visited pages on our website, so I think that there is a lot of demand for it. July is a terrible month for schools um, mm. in both hemispheres being on holiday, so yeah, we're really looking at that. Hopefully very soon, I'm looking for this to do it. Fantastic, that's what we like to have. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, what's one of the biggest mindsets around plastic use um, that you have? So the question is, what's the one of the biggest mindsets around plastic use that we have perspective on? I'll, I'll tell you mine, which I think is kind of pretty universal. It's the fact that just because a piece of packaging has that beautiful 
feel good recycling symbol of the three chasing arrows with the number in the middle. Because it has that symbol on there, it doesn't mean that it's going to get recycled. So that that um, that number in that recycling symbol just tells us what kind of plastic it is. So this is number one seven, and it's just the material type of seven carbon, which could be found. And so the question we need to ask isn't is it recyclable? Because technically most plastic is. But apart from, been not going for too long here because no, it's very exciting about <laughs> this, but so like, apart from number one and two, which is like the clear uh, water bottles, soft drink bottles, milk bottles, but the, the three to seven, there's not a lot of value in those plastics. So our local governments collect them, the, the um, facilities can sort them, but once you take into account those costs, is typically more expensive. They can't recoup them from those other materials. Um, one and two, and say aluminium, would be more valuable. It does change over time in various locations. But I think, you know, I think that that misconception is that, that having that recycling symbol on our packaging has lulled us. And that was a very intentional move by the American Chemistry Council in the 90s. 70s, and I think it's lulled us as a society into this sense of, well, it's okay to use it because it's going to be recycled, and then I'm doing a really good thing. And we all know now that it's not quite as good as that. I mean, that kind of leads me to another question, Rebecca, which is about, uh, and it kind of links to the question about the future, sort of where plastic free goes from here, because it does seem to me that getting a momentum around people changing behavior and sort of carrots rather than sticks is very useful. But that um, it does lead to the question of trust because that symbol makes me wonder that the fact of it, the continuance of it makes me wonder how much um, manipulation then is possible, even with something like Plastic Free July, would, you know, you're, they're saying they're doing it, but how much auditing, are there others who do auditing and is that again something, is there a value in that kind of stuff? Going back to the question of shame versus, um, when it comes to corporations, is there a role for shame? I guess that's, let me be specific with the question. Yeah, I think there is a value in holding businesses accountable for their packaging. Um, and there are, certainly organisations out there that are working on this plastic issue that are, are now kind of participating in plastic free July and getting people to sign up that that is their modus mm. operandi. Like, you know, that is their, their mission. thing that they do. Um, and I think that's a really, really important piece of work. We've been, um, as, a, as a charity, we've been quite, spent quite a lot of time working on what is our mission right. and our vision is a world without plastic waste. And, and our mission is to build a global movement which dramatically reduces plastic use and increases recycling. So the behaviour change is the flagship and the big part of it, but those other things are, are absolutely in, important. And I feel like the sort of, there's an ecosystem yeah. out there of solutions, and mm. we will very much point our participants at the, at the end of July to hear all of no these other things that are, that are going on. That's useful. I think yeah. that idea of an ecosphere and that there's multiple things happening um, and that for those who want to, this is an entry point and for those who want to stay in this field, it, gets, it can only get bigger and bigger, but there's other places to go as well. I think that's such a powerful, again, way of thinking about it in an inclusive manner. Yeah, and I think another thing I want to want to say on that, like in terms of the role of that was, I'll give you an example of, um, you know, a few. I can't. I don't know how many years ago it was, but some time ago, Target um, banned, got rid of plastic shopping bags, right? And then it was fifty cents or whatever to buy to get that bag, and they got fifty letters of complaint from their customers, and over a few years. So they reversed their decision. They bought back the free plastic bag. This was pre-bag ban. Mm. 
from 50 letters. And then, so that had these 50 letters of complaint. Out of the whole target around the world with millions and millions? No, just within Australia. Okay. okay. And so, but that's, still, right? but that's still a very small number of people to complain. So they had these 50 letters, and then when they flipped that decision, brought the plastic bag back in, they had hundreds and thousands of people writing in. So, you know, and they're like, but we supported it, but we said nothing. Mm. And so, you know, when, when people talk to me about their, mm. you know, being fr feeling frustrated with, I love this product, my kids love it, they love this cereal, you know, and I'm as guilty of this as, as, as anybody. Um, I deal with this ongoing. <laughs> but, you know, of, I always think and, and say that, like, we need to, you know, support and give credit to businesses that are doing the right thing, but equally for businesses to have their customers to write to them and say, I love your brand because of this, um, but I'm trying to reduce my plastics and could you look at changing this? Mm. That is the most powerful mm. thing. And there are organisations that are, you know, specifically working on this, although they're buying um, shares and getting those you buy that say made that EPMs and doing it in a slightly different way. But yeah. you know, yeah. it is an equal thing for everyone. Yeah. That's great. There's one more question on 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 Zoom. Online, yeah, yes. online. Uh Yvette says, hello, what is your opinion on e Oh, that's a clever one. <laughs> so the question was, I'm not going to repeat the names, they're all um, brand names, but so there is a, a number of different synthetic fibres, fabric made from recycled plastic bottles. So typically, so of all the plastics made in the world, only 9% have ever been recycled and 0.9% have been recycled more than once. So we talk, when we talk about recycling, it's, it's not really recycling, it's more downcycling. So mm. if you're lucky, 9% gets one more use and a very small fraction gets more than once. So this fabrics that this person is um, asking the question about, they've been made from recycled plastic bottles. And so my opinion on that is if, at a personal level, if I am buying um, clothing, I would tend, I, I, I choose as much as I can to buy secondhand and stick to natural fibres. Because we now know that when you're washing synthetic fibres, they shed tiny microscopic little fragments of microplastic, microplastic microfibres. They're too small to be captured by our washing machine waste treatment systems and it end up in our ocean. Um, it and so there's things that need to change there. So they're all synthetic fabrics that this person is asking about. I think a lot of those particular brands are used in swimwear. Um, I don't know, I haven't read enough about the research to make comment on are they how how much they would shed when they in the ocean or exercising outdoors. There is obviously some risk there. We need to be making sure our washing machines have the filters to capture these these fibers. Um, on the one hand, I think it's great that we have this use and we need to develop markets to use this material more than once. Um, at the same time, I, I want to see my plastic packaging going back into plastic packaging and going back into packaging again. Like we need to be using it in a truly circular fashion, not just one more time. And um, one of the... Um, you know, there are a number of brands out there that are creating these designer sports shoes or um, bathers or whatever it is, but it's still, we've got to take it back and use it in the mainstream. Some of our supermarkets here in Australia um, are collecting soft plastics, the film plastics that are 
packaging and then they're turning those into park benches or bollards or, or playground matting. But they're just bought by council. They're typically bought by local government. It's not us, right, I need a new chair, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I'm going to buy a chair that's made out mm -hmm. of this material. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I think it's great because it's starting the conversation, it's starting the road towards the mission. It's engaging people and you've got to start somewhere. But at the same time, I think I think it's kind of almost a little bit um, well we're just gonna tinker around the edges here. We have to we have to be requiring people to use recycled content in mm -hmm. everything we're making. Yeah. Yeah. That's just a comment which maybe is a good way to finish it up. Uh, because not quite an international audience. <laughs> Hello, Rebecca, from Linda Emerson of Wild Lucy in Jupiter, Florida, US. Oh, I'm so you. happy to see how far Plastic Free July has come since we met at the sixth international uh, latrine debris conference. We are joining you from around the North Atlantic watershed to reduce plastic use and restore healthy oceans. Oh, fantastic. Oh, thank you, Linda. Lovely to have you join us. And Linda is just one of the many champions around the world who has made Plastic Free July a global movement because if it wasn't for people like her and people in this room and all the people whose stories we told in the book, it would just be me and my family. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, to, so thank you, everybody. Ten words, ten like powerful words from Rebecca's book, um, which started this movement and I think can continue it going. I'm going plastic free next month. Who wants to join? Thank you, everyone. Can we take these little babies out? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank Rebecca. You. That was really fantastic. Thank you. That was good questions <laughs> from everyone.